Behold, the Intel Edison, the cornerstone of our personal area network. So, question is, why did I pick up an Intel Edison? Well, that's the question, isn't it? Uh, I mean, it's not the cheapest, it's not the fastest. And in the world of Linux, no one really cares about x86 compatibility because Linux will run on <laughs> Linux will run on a toaster. So I mean, you can <laughs> you can boot up and install kernel 4.0 on your toaster. It might take two years to compile, but you can do it. This is x86 and it's faster than your father's Pentium 4. But you know why? Why the Edison? Well, because it's tiny, it has Wi-Fi and it has Bluetooth. That's really that's really the reason. Allow me to introduce a project. Codename Tardigrade. The Intel Edison as a security token. Yeah, I know, Intel developing security hardware? Well, uh, no. Now, it's, uh, <laughs> when we're talking about security hardware, really, the cool security hardware are like the security tokens that have like a cryptographic processor and they're sealed in epoxy and they just do the one calculation and that's, you know, that's a thing. Those are very, very secure, but they're very, very single purpose. And so I was thinking, what if I could use Edison kind of as a platform for something that's reasonably secure, not as secure as a smart card, not as secure as, you know, like the, the smart chips, the crypto chips that are, that, you know, have that uh, proprietary crypto smart card interface, but something that would be a little more secure even than uh, running a cell phone, like running, like I have my cell phone, my cell phone's always on. And yeah, I mean, there's an encrypted wallet on there. There's an encrypted file with passwords, but you know, if someone could surreptitiously install software on it, or maybe the carrier is doing something and the internet connection is always on. I don't really want to turn off the internet connection because I sort of want to be updated on everything. There's not really a good way to get true privilege separation between processes that are running on my phone and something else. And so I think that the Edison being the ultimate tiny portable Linux box, I mean, it's got the, got the lithium polymer interface circuit. We can basically just 3D print a housing for it, run some wires and like, you know, a couple couple solder points, not really a big deal. And we can basically have a self-contained battery operated Wi-Fi and Bluetooth enabled Linux box that can be our secure bastion of cryptographic keys, SSH keys, passwords, whatever we need. And then for the interface, we can use Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. And with Bluetooth, we can pair a headset for audio. And we, can, we can pair a keyboard. It's not really an option for a screen. Um, it would be possible to add a screen with the uh, the GPIO breakout pins, but that gets into more soldering and, and more headache. And I would sort of like to keep the first version of this project to require as little soldering as possible. I sort of want to come up with a software solution that doesn't really require a lot of hardware. Um, and the hardware it does require maybe could be 3D printed. So that's just sort of the rationale. And in reality with cell phones, I'm not really super worried about, you know, the applications being compromised. But it is enough of a worry that I would like to have an air gap between those, you know, secure things so that they're at least not always on the phone. I mean, if I have to key in a password on the phone or if I have to do something on the phone, to me, that's not as bad as the secure file just being there all the time because it could get out and, you know, I wouldn't even know, especially if somebody's messing around with my phone or, or whatever. I also kind of hesitate to use somebody else's computer for SSH work. And there's also the evil maid attack where, you know, if you leave your computer in your hotel room and you go out and you come back, has somebody mess with your computer, you know, you don't, you don't really know. If there's a key logger installed and you're having to put in, you know, you're typing a password or a passphrase, that's maybe not a good situation uh, from a security standpoint. So wouldn't it be cool if we could somehow sort of move all of that authentication somewhere else. And I think Edison presents an opportunity for us to be able to do that with a security token. I know there are apps out there for cell phones that can encrypt and store these kinds of things, but I really like the air gap that the Edison potentially has. I mean, I can turn it off and it's not going to, you know, take out email with it. I can uh, reboot it. I can SSH into it. It's its own piece of hardware that has its own processor. And so it can be engineered with its own defenses and its own smarts that are running in a completely self-contained, completely isolated kind of a way. So what I have in mind with Edison is to really turn it into a digital assistant that can store secure information uh, for me without really necessarily having to put as much trust in other devices as I would have to otherwise. I can be able to carry it with me and you know sort of keep it with me at all times. It can have its own power system. I can have uh, my own direct interface through a, uh, a headset. So I think that it works out 
in a lot of ways. It makes sense in a lot of ways, but I know there are apps out there that can encrypt and store this kind of thing, and I use those, but I like the air gap approach as well. Call me old fashioned if you want. Edison has built-in USB serial, Bluetooth, and Wi-Fi. Our micro edition also has a built-in lithium polymer header that can be used to charge and discharge uh, a lithium polymer battery, which means that we can run Edison off of battery and when we plug in a 7 to 15 volt DC power, then it's going to charge the battery. This is perfect for putting in a 3D printed case. So how does it work? How would we build a security token with the Intel Edison? Well, we've got Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and optional USB serial to work with. So let's take a look. First, make sure Edison's turned on and running from battery power. I've already done all the work here with the software. This is really just a demonstration. We should hear Edison let us know that it sees the network and has joined the network through Bluetooth because my Bluetooth headset was already paired. In the background, Edison will also sync his logs to a server on the internet. The logs will include the MAC addresses, IP addresses, dates and times of any devices that have interacted with it. New connection from 192.168.43.1. Verification PIN 45291. Once Edison is connected, it reminds me of its IP address or it reads me its IP address because it may not get the IP address every time. This is a little clunky and there's, there's probably a better solution here, but this is good enough for now. Joining Wi-Fi network, it hurts when IP. We will go through the browser on the cell phone uh, or other Wi-Fi connected device that is a trusted device for me to um, sort of log into Edison and then I've got a menu of options of things that I can do. For me, trust is not necessarily black and white. There can be a gray area. So for SSH, the first feature of Edison that I'm going to demo, I can select a list of known hosts that I want to connect to and Edison will open up the, an SSH port user and a password. Optionally, the one-time use password that Edison generates here can be used in extra secure mode where Edison actually reads me the last few characters of the password directly into my Bluetooth headset and those are not output on the display of the phone. The last four characters of server a password is Victor Bravo Delta 9. This is really good if you don't necessarily trust your phone uh, has has been or has not been compromised. Um, because between if the phone were compromised, you would know something weird is going on because Edison is telling you stuff that's going on in your headset that's not going on on your phone. And so you could just pull the power and, and, and secure it again because something has happened. In the situation that you know, you've got that one time use password that Edison has generated and you don't want to key it in from the screen on another device that you're actually logging in with, then that's fine. You don't have to use the password from the screen. You could use part of the password from the screen and then get a few characters from your phone. Um, that connection is one time use. So what's happening is when I select a host on Edison, the, the, the public, uh, the private key uh, on Edison is already trusted on that host. Edison can always SSH to that particular host. So the situation with what's going on here is that Edison is able to connect to whatever the remote host is and it's doing that itself. And then it's connecting up a local port and a local SSH daemon. It's not really an SSH daemon. It's sort of a locked down SSH daemon uh, with its own local user and password. And so when you connect to that local SSH account with the one time use password uh, that it has generated, that terminal is connected up to the terminal that actually goes to the host that we want to go to. In this way, the machine that you're connecting from doesn't know anything about the SSH connection that's actually running over the connection that, that Edison is using. The, the connection that Edison is using is, you know, through the Wi-Fi hotspot or whatever, uh, or the whatever Wi-Fi connection that it's actually connected to. So I guess you can see the host that it's connecting to and, and some other information, but by and large, it's really just storing the information. So with this setup, Edison's actually the one that's making the secure connections. You're making a connection to Edison and Edison is basically being used as a proxy in that standpoint. Now it doesn't do it right now, but it could very easily uh, do a proxy to a third party network uh, or its own SSH tunnel before actually SSHing out from there, depending on whether or not you trust the Wi-Fi. In my particular use case, I'm using the Wi-Fi hotspot off of a cell phone, which is maybe more trusted than some sort of, you know, target Wi-Fi network at, at like a business or a hotel or something. But the same kind of approach could work with hotel Wi-Fi as long as you can get a secure connection to Edison. You could get a secure connection to Edison through uh, serial as well. That's an option. So as long as Edison can get on the internet, your uh, tunnel is basically going through Edison. And Edison is the one that is doing all of the actual authentication and all the actual login. But the passwords and the keys never actually leave Edison. So now think about what happens if a computer has a keylogger on it. 
Well, I'm using the computer that has the key logger and I've connected to Edison. I've put in a password, but it's a one-time use password. This password is never gonna be used for anything ever again. I haven't really had to generate a private key or public key on the untrusted computer that's associated with an actual real server somewhere or something that I'm connecting to. So that's pretty well insulated. It's also true that the mechanism of Edison means that I've only got one connection. There's no option for, like if there's a team of operatives in the other room or whatever, and they're monitoring what's going on, uh, you know, if I've installed my public key on a server on the internet, they could use the memory of the computer or they could use files that are stored on the computer that I'm using in order to make their own connection, their own a second connection. Because we're going through Edison, there's not really an option to have a second connection unless I go through the Wi-Fi interface and create a second connection and then I'm going to hear the thing on the, on the headset and then it's going to send me on through. So that's kind of neat. Um, I really think that, I mean, the process could obviously be more refined. And, uh, you know, obviously there are, <laughs> there, are, there are a myriad of ways to improve the process. But for me, this was just a fun experiment to sort of mess around. So that's authentication and passwords. Well, what about Bitcoin? The Bitcoin setup is really not finalized, but I just wanted to give you an idea. Basically, the wallet is stored on Edison and a web UI can be used to capture and upload a QR code in order to make a transaction. Or you can copy paste a Bitcoin code from you know an email or something like that on your phone into the web interface here. The nice thing here is that your wallet is never actually on your phone or on the device that you're using. It's always on Edison, which theoretically is a, you know, a secure platform. Now the SSH keys, the passwords, the uh, Bitcoin wallets on Edison, those are all stored on an encrypted file system that is mounted loopback. Now, one problem that it has right now is that when you first boot up Edison, I either have to use a Bluetooth keyboard or the initial serial console to actually mount the encrypted file system. And so when I turn off Edison, it's really just putting it to sleep and waking it up. And if I pull power, then it's it reboots, but that also has the effect of unmounting the encrypted file system. That may, that may be a feature or an annoyance, depending on your point of view. Now, one reason that I decided to share this with you guys is because I'm curious what your thoughts are and if you have any ideas for improvement and if this could actually be turned into something useful. I'm sort of on the fence. I mean, it's cool, it's a novelty, it was a lot of fun to play with. It could be a valuable product, I don't know. There are a couple of secure Bitcoin fobs or tokens that have similar functionality from the Bitcoin standpoint, but I don't really know of anything that has similar functionality uh, for storing SSH keys and, and that kind of thing that doesn't add a significant amount of bulk that you have to carry around. With this, I could have, you know, I mean, it could be, it could be something I keep in my pocket, but my interface for it is my phone. It could almost be an oversized keychain. I mean, I could have something like this on a keychain and I can imagine that, you know, Intel Edison generation 2.0 is gonna be half as big and maybe generation 3.0 is gonna be half as big as that. And so at that point, we're, we're definitely in keychain territory for the, the, the whole system. The standby power on this when Edison's asleep is like five milliwatts, 10 milliwatts, something like that. Even with Wi-Fi enabled and the system basically doing no ops, um, the power consumption I've measured at about 33 milliwatts, which is pretty good. I mean, that's that's pretty good in terms of power utilization. I mean, if, if the system is running full tilt this size lithium polymer battery pack, I'm, I'm gonna get two or three hours of power out of it. And in terms of standby power, I'm gonna get days of power. So I'm pretty happy with that. Now I've really glossed over a lot here, and this is more concept than finished product. Really, it's just something to get you guys kind of excited about it. What do you think? Do you think this is worth Kickstartering or something like that? The case could be 3D printed. We could just design a 3D printable case for it. That would be easy enough. And the hardware really does require a minimum of soldering. If we want to add a screen or a GPS unit, we would either have to do that as a module that you guys would have to buy that would be designed to minimize the amount of soldering, or uh, we, we would just not do that for the first version and then maybe a second version or a later version we could do that. Um, I can see Kickstarter going to fund developers to actually do the development, the software development, to really polish this and bring it up to speed. But the great thing about software development is that once it's developed, you know, that's a sunk cost. And so I could see if, if we did do a Kickstarter, that if all of the development costs were covered by Kickstarter, then at the end of it, whenever all the development was done, we would just open source what we had and hope that it had enough momentum that the community would pick it up and then run with it. I could see this kind of uh, this kind of a thing being used as sort of a secure credential storage or secure, you know, secure device storage or whatever that is basically a secure token. I can see this evolving into sort of a whole new um, type of hardware. For me, I like it because I can SSH into it 
from whatever and actually do stuff. So if I want to do the Bitcoin stuff, I can do it from the command line. And that's why the web interface is not really as polished as it could be. Because I want to make sure that the, the, the web interface is as locked down as it possibly can be. The other nice thing is that because it, it can be air gapped, I mean, you can put it to sleep and as long as it's sleeping, nobody can connect to it. It's really secure. If your Bitcoins are stored that way, it's still pretty convenient because you don't have to like get out a memory card and plug it in and then hope for the best. And then once it's plugged in, somebody could copy your memory cards. The operations that you're allowed to do through the device are, are basically limited, but it's not as limited as a piece of hardware. It's also not as secure as a dedicated piece of hardware, but maybe it's a happy medium. So I don't know, a Kickstarter might be kind of fun. Uh, it might be kind of fun to do that and really polish up the interface, really polish up the thing. It might be good to get a security consultant and just have them validate and make sure that everything is as secure as it possibly can be and as locked down as it possibly can be. Obviously, if this is something that somebody's going to use for five or 10 years, there are going to be vulnerabilities in the software because it's Linux and because it's x86 and because x86 has some, you know, hardware features. I'm not really sure you know, like trusted execution, no execute pages, things like that are supported on the version of the Atom that is on here. But if it is, then maybe we can get SE Linux running on Yocto or something, because Yocto is the distribution that this uses. If that's even an option, it would be good from a security standpoint. But those are questions that will take a lot of developer time to figure out, and I don't particularly want to do that. But maybe this is something that should be kickstarted. I don't know. What do you guys think about the idea here? What do you guys think about you know, sort of where I am right now. Head on over to the forums at techsyndicate.com and I'll see you there. I'm Wendell, I'm signing out. Mm -hmm.